It is a pleasure to welcome you to the third edition of the lecture series on advancements in geotechnical engineering, from research to practice. The AGERP lecture series is a pro bono initiative led by Dr. Partha Mishra and Professor Sarat Das. Initiated in 2020, it is aimed at disseminating the coupled learnings from academia and industry on some of the key topics in geotechnical engineering. The International Workshop on Biogeotechnics was hosted in 2022 during the third edition of the AGERP lecture series. The following lecture on bio-inspired deep foundations, soil anchors, and site characterization probes was delivered by Dr. Alejandro Martinez at this workshop. Dr. Alejandro Martinez is an assistant professor at the University of California, Davis. He obtained his PhD and MS degrees from Georgia Tech in 2015 and 2012, respectively, and his BS from the University of Texas at Austin in 2010. His research aims to further the understanding of soil behavior and soil inclusion interactions involved in geotechnical engineering as well as in burrowing and locomotion. His research interests include bio-inspired geotechnics, soil structure interactions, fabric effects on soil behavior, and static and cyclic liquefaction of soils. His research employs a combination of experimental laboratory, centrifuge modeling, and numerical techniques. He received the NSF Career Award and ASCE Arthur Casagrande Career Development Award, and in 2019 he co-organized and co-led the first international workshop for bio-inspired geotechnics. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an honor uh, and a pleasure to be able to share some of the research we have done at uh, UC Davis, along with uh, other collaborators. Uh, on uh, by inspiration and, and how we can apply it to deep foundations, soil anchors, and site characterization probes. Great, so this is a, an outline of my presentation. I'll start with motivation and background in more general terms uh, about uh, why uh, are we looking into bioinspiration. And then my first topic will be on snakeskin inspired foundations, followed by the tree root inspired anchors. And then finally on the Bioinspire probes, and then I will wrap up with some closing thoughts. So starting with motivation and background, uh, sustainability and environmental impacts are uh, a large motivation for biogeotechnics. And I think we, we uh, all know that current construction practices use materials and uh, energy at rates that cannot be sustained in the future. And so for example here, this um, figure shows uh, some data that uh, quantify the, the percentage of uh, material use by the construction industry. And we see that that is greater than 75%. So there's certainly something that uh, we can do as part of the construction industry. Um, natural uh, systems like uh, animals and plants and bacteria are actually very good analogs for this because they have limited resources they have limited material and limited energy, and yet they have to survive. They have, they have to be efficient. And um, in addition, there's a lot of parallels with what um, an engineered system seeks to do. Uh, for example, we, we build tunnels, so we need to excavate the soil. We build tall and, and slender structures. We uh, penetrate the soil to deploy sensors and build structures in dense areas, and also retain earth. Uh, for excavations. And uh, on the other hand, animals and plants need to transfer load to soil to move. They build foundations, which are roots, for example, of trees. And there's a range of organisms that penetrate and excavate soils uh, of different types. And so uh, typically, uh, the, the field of biogeotechnics, it's, it's uh, broken down into two subfields. Uh, today, I'll be focusing on the bioinspired geotechnics which uh, focuses on the abstraction and translation of biological strategies to develop new engineering solution. So we don't use any biological process directly. We rather uh, understand them and then apply them. That is uh, slightly different than biomediated where we initiate and regulate biochemical processes to produce changes in, for example, engineering properties of soils. Uh, this is an image uh, here on the right that kind of shows the vision of what we hope um, the bioinspired geotechnics uh, or, or just biogeotechnics leads to, which is uh, a schematic of a site where uh, there's a lot of biogeotechnic solutions from ground improvement 
Dupayo is in, inspired by, by snakeskin, root uh, system inspired anchors, uh, and so on. And one of the main drivers for bioinspired geotechnics is that it has been shown that natural solutions can be significantly more efficient than human uh, technology. And here's uh, just two examples. This one is an excavation and this one study showed that tunnel boring machines like this one use two to three orders of magnitude more energy than ants to excavate a meter of soil, a meter cubed of soil. And so we quantify and we know that ant tunneling is a lot more efficient. And another example in Anchorage, and I'll actually talk about this in my presentation later today, but this one um, um, compares the efficiency per material volume or material mass of three root systems, these are natural root systems from trees, to that of a micropile system to achieve the same capacity. And we see that the root systems are about 10 times more efficient. So um, how do we do that? There's different frameworks for, for the, for the bio-inspired design. One um, that uh, we like here at UC Davis is this one by Mack and Shue, the one uh, of the forms, behaviors, and principles, where the, the abstraction and the translation can be made in terms of forms, which are very direct things like mimicking shapes and mimicking sizes. Behaviors getting more abstract, uh, and finally, principles. And so one thing that I like to keep in mind is that the more direct the translation is, for example, with the forms, the more affected the solution could be by differences in spatial and temporal scales. Uh, this just enough principle that biologists um, um, have described as well as limitations related to the multifunctionality of the biological strategies. One example here, if we're looking into uh, uh, interfaces that mobilize directional friction, we could, for example, look at a snake uh, and look at its skin. And so this is a 3D scan and, and a cross section. So for a very direct translation, we could um, mimic the snake shape, uh, the snake scale shape and size. For the behavior, we could understand how the asperities interact with soil and then do the translation that way. And in the most abstract sense, if we, for example, realize that the, the directional friction comes from passive resistances, then we can capitalize on those. Uh, translating the biological strategies uh, is, is, uh, is a tricky process. And that is uh, especially because the, the scales are quite different, both in terms of spatial as well as in temporal. This is just a simple example to show that uh, tree roots, for, uh, as well as organisms like insects, they live in very shallow locations. While if we wanted to learn something from them and apply it to, uh, let's say, uh, foundations for a building, those foundations will reach much greater depths where the stresses are much bigger. So we need to make sure that whatever we learn from these organisms also applies for these different conditions. And another point is that fundamentally, the behavior of, of the soils depend on the type and the magnitude of the interparticle forces. So these are relationships for uh, interparticle forces as a function of particle diameter that show that, for example, for high st uh, effective stress, one megapascal, the skeletal forces pretty much govern the behavior for most soils, as seen by this dashed line. But if we're in a shallow location where the effective stress is smaller, it could be the skeletal, skeletal force or capillary force or drag forces. And so we need to keep this in mind. Um, moving on to the first topic on, on snakeskin-inspired foundations. And today I will only present results on the monotonic uh, behavior. Um, and so we're looking at soil structure interfaces and, and they're important because in fact, most of the load transfer between structures and soils takes place at this interface. And I really like these figures from uh, Hayward Baker that show all of the planes of contact between soils and, and structural elements. And examples are, are many, uh, deep foundations, soil nails, tunnels, uh, et cetera. And so then we have the concept of frictional directionality. Uh, and this is uh, where a surface could develop different amounts of friction depending on the direction of movement. And this is a, an interesting concept because uh, in particular foundation elements, 
can be subjected to different um, uh, loadings during their installation and service life. And uh, I, I like to call this a design dilemma because we would like for the skin friction to be large uh, because that would lead to a high capacity. So that would be good for our design. But at the same time, we need to install this foundation. So we actually need, or we would like to have a small skin friction to have that uh, foundation be easier. Here's a, an, a, a schematic with a few examples. If we drive a pile, then the, the soil is resisting that installation. But if we then uh, load it in tension, then the direction of the skin friction will flip. And now we would like to have a high skin friction. It's a very similar situation for su uh, suction caissons used for offshore applications. And uh, this principle of frictional directionality may even be helpful for pilots in settling ground. So we looked at the literature and um, at the biological literature and saw different organisms that solved this problem. For example, the feet of gecko and, and the feet of beetles have done that and the, the skin of sharks, as well as grass leaves. They have a lot of uh, spikes. However, all of these solutions rely on bending and changing of the shape quite a lot. In the end, we looked at uh, snakes and we uh, selected the snake ventral scales for this because they are more rigid. And so uh, in particular, the ventral scales, those are the scales in the, in the belly of the snake, they control the frictional interactions with the ground and those are uh, the, the scales that allow it to move. And so the questions we would like to answer here are, for example, what is the range of frictional directionalities that can be mobilized at soil structure interfaces? And also uh, how can we apply this uh, towards the foundations. So uh, just a couple definitions here. Uh, the ventral scales, again, they're the scales on the belly of the snake. This is a 3D scan of the snake along with uh, cross section as shown here. So if we were to move this patch of skin to the left, that would mean that the particles would be on this side and they would slide along this milder slope here. That is what we call caudal, the caudal direction or caudal shear. And that is usually associated with a smaller frictional resistance with the particles sliding. The opposite cranial would be moving this patch to the right. And so then the particles would encounter this sharp um, uh, step. And so they could get jammed and that typically leads to higher frictional resistances. And so I'm going to leave this uh, schematic up here uh, just as a reminder for what cranial and caudal mean. Uh, for, for this topic, the, the first thing we did is uh, we uh, talked to a museum that's uh, here uh, close by to us at UC Berkeley. And we brought 60 snake specimens to our lab. Uh, and we selected those in collaboration with biologists. And we then scanned all of those to produce 3D images. And then from those, we idealized and scaled those uh, geometries to generate 3D printed surfaces. And then we were able to test those with sand uh, shown here in a uh, shoe box type of test. And then we implemented those in piles and did centrifuge load tests. And so that's the progression. Uh, I'm gonna first start with laboratory tests. And so, uh, in the laboratory, we uh, performed shear box tests as, as shown, this is our machine. We've done tests in, in a wide range of sands, but today I will uh, only focus on dense Ottawa 2030. And uh, also today I will only focus uh, on this one geometry of, of this asperity uh, with a height of the asperity of 0 0.3 millimeters and a length of 12. And this is just a schematic of what the, the test looks like. Um, just to, to kind of uh, give an overview of, of interface shear response, and, and I'm, I'm going to first show the results for a rough profile and a smooth profile. So here the y-axis shows the stress ratio. This is just a measure of strength. And the x-axis is displacement. And so as we would expect, the rough surface mobilizes a larger strength in one direction, and then we stop, and then we switch directions. Uh, and so uh, that strength is uh, significantly greater than that for the smooth surface. Now we can do a test with our bio-inspired surface. First, we move in the cranial direction 
And in this direction, the strength is similar to that of the rough surface. Then we stop, change directions. Now we're going on the caudal side. And then the strength is similar to the smooth surface. And so this is the concept of frictional directionality, this one surface that can mobilize uh, a different friction depending on the direction. We can do the opposite test. We start with our caudal side first, the strength is lower, and then we switch to cranial and the strength is higher, similar to the Roth case. Uh, these are very similar uh, results showing the greater strength of the cranial and then we flip and that uh, strength is lower, similar to the smooth. But really what I wanted to show you today, uh, right now is just uh, now moving on here to the dilation. This is how much the, the, the specimen dilates. And so in the black line, the rough surface dilates the most, but the cranial shearing dilates uh, just about the same. And so they have a pretty similar behavior. Whereas the caudal shearing uh, induces a much smaller amount of dilation. And so this also contributes to the differences in the behavior. We can run a series of tests uh, as shown here to define our failure envelopes. And we end up with two different interface friction actors. For this uh, one surface with this uh, dimensions for the asperities, in the cranial side, we have friction angle of 32 degrees and on the caudal of 26. And this is irrespective of whether we do cranial first and caudal second or the other way. This actually has interesting implications for the cyclic loading. Uh, and I, I just don't have time to present it today, but you could imagine that if we are doing cyclic loading and especially that loading is symmetric, then we can control the direction of the failure. It will always be on the caudal side. This uh, shows a synthesis of results of tests on 22 different bio-inspired surfaces. Um, and so I'm putting everything together uh, in terms of um, uh, this uh, unitless parameter, uh, the, the length of the asperity divided by the height. So these 22 different uh, surfaces have different lengths and heights. Uh, and so what we see is that this uh, length to height ratio unifies the trends. Uh, and so with increasing L over H, the strength decreases. But the important thing is that the cranial strength is always greater than the caudal. And also we see a greater dilation angle for the cranial side as well. So uh, some takeaways from this section is that uh, shearing in the cranial direction mobilized a greater strength and uh, the friction angle was about 25% 25, uh, 25 greater. Uh, the asperity height and length influenced the, the strength with greater height giving us a greater strength and a smaller length giving us a greater strength because that translates to having more asperities more close together. And finally, cranial shearing led to a greater amount of soil deformations. Moving on now to our application in deep foundations, we used our centrifuge uh, at UC Davis and uh, that has a radius of nine meters, so this is it. The centrifuge is spun. And so once it's spinning, the bucket here rotates and that's where the, the experiment goes. This is a picture inside the bucket and here we see the pile as well as our bed of sand. And uh, the principle of centrifuge testing is that um, it allows us to produce a stress magnitude and distribution that's represent representative of field conditions. Here we performed the test at 30 G and we used the dry poorly graded sand and we installed the piles by uh, pushing, uh, pushing in flight. And so these are our model piles. Our model piles had a prototype length of 10.5 meters. Uh, and a diameter of 0 0.6 meters, uh, and they had five internal strain gauges. So you can see all the cables here from the internal strain gauges. We had five different piles, one uh, that we install, and as we install it, it's, it's in the cranial direction. You can see here the, the particles are going to encounter these sharp edges. Two different piles for caudal installation where the, the particles will slide here, a rough pile, and then a smooth pile for reference. All right, so the, these are the results. The, uh, what I'm getting ready to show you are uh, distributions of load with depth. So depth on the y-axis, on the right is installation, on the left is pull out. And this is color coded to red is rough, blue, smooth, and so on. 
So uh, for the rough pile, we have a large amount of load that's shed in skin friction, as shown here, greatest capacity at the head. And the smooth pile has a very small amount of skin friction as shown here. This is what we would expect. Now let's look at the pile that we install cranially. It has a very similar capacity and distribution as a rough pile, as we would expect. And then the two coily installed piles with the pile that has a, a, a taller asperity mobilizing a slightly greater skin friction here. One thing that's interesting is that the base capacity is not affected too much. Really, the difference is in the skin friction. Now, let's turn around and do that. Now, the rough surface mobilizes a large pullout capacity, the smooth one, a lower one. The caudally pulled one mobilized a small capacity close to the smooth one. I do want to point out that that same pile mobilized a high capacity close to the rough and then a low pullout capacity closer to the smooth. And then the two piles that were easier to install over here are now the ones that apply pullout capacity. And so now we're seeing this concept of frictional directionality uh, in piles and how that affects the distribution with that. I'm gonna grab these three piles and show a little bit more results. Uh, for the local skin friction, um, these are distributions with depth. And so what I show here is local skin friction during installation. Uh, those are the solid symbols and then during pullout for the rough pile. And the ratio of those two is about 0 0.4. I do the same for the cranially installed pile. And so as we would expect that ratio decreases to about 0.2 because the cranial installation mobilizes a greater local stress. And finally, the caudally uh, installed pile cranially pulled flips, now the pullout resistance is greater than the uh, installation one. And the ratio is about 1.4. And finally, we can look at the relationships of uh, the shear stress with displacement for the rough pile, which mobilizes large stresses, but the, the cranially pulled pile is this one, mobilizes the greatest one, and then the caudally pulled pile mobilizes the smallest one. The uh, point I would like to make here is that the difference in friction angle of these two surfaces is just 25%. And so that alone cannot explain this large difference in local stress. What explains the large difference in local stress is how the normal stresses change around the pile. In other words, the normal stresses on this pile, the purple one, are uh, significantly greater than for the green one. So with that, uh, I would like to, to give some takeaways for this, and that is that the skin friction magnitude and its distribution of depth had a dependency on the direction of loading and how that uh, was uh, relative to the orientation of the vine inspired texture. Also, while the friction angles were different, the different capacities really comes from the differences in the normal stress acting on the pile. Um, we have performed uh, cyclic tests and the analysis is uh, underway right now. And we're also planning for a field deployment uh, uh, in the future. Moving on to the second topic of tree root inspired soil anchors. Um, soil anchors are typically used in earth retention systems. Uh, different types are uh, tiebacks and helical anchors as well as grouted anchors. Uh, and so in nature, uh, an analog for that would be a root system uh, root systems provide anchorage to trees uh, against gravity and wind forces, uh, but they also provide water and nutrients from, uh, from the soil to the tree. And the architecture is one of the key uh, aspects, and that architecture varies a lot depending on environmental and physiological needs. And so some of the questions we're trying to answer here are, what are the architectural attributes that control the anchorage capacity? And how can those be applied towards the design of soil anchors? Um, we did uh, field tests here at uh, UC Davis, and we had this unique opportunity in that in our uh, plant science department, we have a, they have a site that's relatively homogeneous. They have trees with the same trunk diameter and same age, but they are grafted on different rootstocks. And here you can see pictures of the three rootstocks we tested, Lavelle, Mariana, and Meyer Ballant. 
Um, we developed this mobile testing apparatus where uh, we can use a hand crane uh, in a trolley to pull the trees out of the ground. Uh, we can also perform surveys um, uh, using an air spade to uh, see how many roots remained in the ground, uh, essentially broke. We also have 3D models based on LiDAR and photogrammetry, and we also took soil samples and did CPT soundings for characterizing the soil. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a root system as it's failing. And so we can see that the uh, root soil ball is separating from the ground. So it brings a decent amount of soil. As you'll see in, in, in the next slide, the, the response is quite ductile. And, and one of the main reasons for that is that the roots themselves are, are, are ductile, they're flexible. And so that takes uh, place or, or that takes part in low transfer. And also there's root cooperation taking place. So these are some load displacement curves for the different trees. We have the Lovell uh, rootstock that gave us the smallest capacity, but really interesting is we pulled this tree for 25 centimeters and we can see the load has not dropped very significantly, very constant load. Mariana gave us a medium capacity with limited softening. And the Meyer Ballen gave us the greatest peak capacity, uh, more than twice of the Lovell, but it uh, strain softened quite a bit, as shown here. These are summaries of the measurements. The stiffness, the Meyer Ballen gave us the greatest one, Lovell the smallest one, peak capacity as well, but softening, the Meyer Ballen uh, softened the most. And so that's uh, perhaps not a desirable attribute. These are 3D models of uh, different trees, Lavelle, Marianne, and Meyer Ballen. These were made based on LiDAR and photogrammetry. So the Lavelle had the most asymmetric architecture as we see here. The Mariana had the shallowest roots, but they reached the greatest horizontal distances. And the Meyer Ballen had uh, the most inclined roots that reached the greatest depths. So from this, we were able to quantify distributions of surface area with depth. And some of the things we see is that the Lovell had uh, relatively, uh, uh, not the shallowest, but relatively shallow roots. The Mariana had uh, the shallowest roots in fact, but, but again, they reach greater horizontal distances. Whereas for the Meyer Ballen, they reach greater depths. And that's what we believe um, gave the Meyer Ballen the greatest capacity. Uh, and also the fact that they were inclined also increases the, the bearing area for that rootstock. However, we did find differences in the soil properties, uh, particularly near the Meyer Ballen rootstock, the, the water contents were smaller, which translates to greater suction. However, it's unclear whether that was um, differences in, in the site. And actually the grain size distributions were, were uniform all across. It could actually be uh, uh, an effect of the actual root uh, producing a greater suction in the soil for the Meyer Ballen. So um, coming back to these efficiencies, we, we calculated material efficiencies in terms of capacity per volume or capacity per mass for the three. The Meyer Ballen, uh, as we would expect, are the most efficient ones. But then we wanted to compare this to, to uh, um, a solution we use in geotechnical engineering commonly. And so we, what we did is we calculated um, the size of a micropile that we would need to reach the same capacity. And then we took the ratio of those. And essentially what these say is that the Lovell is 10 times more efficient than a micropile in terms of mass, uh, but the Meyer Ballen is about 17 times more efficient. And so essentially there is something in the architecture that is uh, increasing the efficiency. And so takeaways from these field tests are that the root architecture had a great uh, effect on the capacity. The root systems with the deeper, more inclined roots generate the greatest capacity. However, we must uh, also account for the differences in soil water content at different locations. And um, there's several aspects that still need to be understood. For example, how do the roots cooperate? In other words, the progressive mobilization of the skin friction and the bearing capacity. Uh, 
how do the roots interact with each other? And in particular, do we have any overlapping failure zones? Uh, the effect of material flexibility, and as well as another important point is, how do we build these things in the future? And that's a very important aspect that needs to be addressed. The next investigation, we moved on to the centrifuge. Now we use the one meter centrifuge here at UC Davis. So here you can see our actuator as well as our anchors shown here. And here we perform tests at different G levels. Uh, and so at 1G, 10 and 25G with the goal of uh, having different overburdened stresses on our anchors. We use dry, poorly graded sand and we wished in place uh, the, the anchors and all the dimensions I'm presenting are in model scale. So uh, this is uh, an image of all of our anchors. We uh, greatly simplified uh, the geometry uh, because we wanted to be able to separate some of these effects. We have as a reference, a plate anchor, and then an anchor with eight branches, four branches and two branches. And uh, the overburden changes with the G level because it gets multiplied by the end, which again is the G level. Now showing you some of the results over here on the left, this is just a uh, 1G test showing that the plate anchor mobilizes the greatest capacity as we would expect because it has the greatest bearing area, followed by the, the anchor with eight branches, four branches, and then two, uh, two branches. Here on the right are the corresponding, corresponding results, but for a 25G acceleration. So now the difference in the y-axis up to 800 Newtons now. And so again, the plate anchor mobilizes the greatest capacity followed by the eight branches, four branches, and two branches. We then um, wanted to put this uh, in, in, in terms of something we could compare and, and a parameter that's used a lot in uh, uh, soil anchor design is the normalized capacity. It's essentially normalized by uh, the overburdened stress and the area. And so that NQ parameter, we see that uh, if we plot it as a function of the area, normalized to the area of the plate anchor, uh, that capacity is greatest for the one with only two root, uh, only two branches as shown here. And as we increase the number of branches, four, eight, and the plate anchor, that normalized capacity decreases. So the reason for this is that the failure um, mechanism is changing. For the plate anchor, we have a shallow failure mechanism as shown here. This is just an example of another paper, but uh, we did see the failure propagating all the way to the surface. For the eight branches, uh, the failure also propagates all the way to the surface. And so the failure zones are interacting with each other in a negative way. But if we only have two branches, each of the two branches is producing a localized failure that's a deep failure, and that gives it a, greatest, a greater normalized capacity. Another interesting point that we saw is that the normalized capacity decreases with increasing G level. And so in fact, the differences for the different uh, anchor models was greatest at low, um, uh, at low G levels and at high G levels of 25 that uh, the points uh, end up closer to each other, but still uh, the root system with two branches gives us a greatest capacity. And this is really due to the suppression of dilation. This is a very similar slide. The only thing I changed here is uh, these two plots, which now show the normalized stiffness and very similar results. The um, uh, uh, soil anchor with the smallest area uh, with only two branches mobilize the greatest stiffness and also the stiffness decrease with increasing G level. So a few takeaways from this. Uh, the root architecture uh, is important and uh, in spe uh, especially the change in the failure mechanism from shallow for a plate anchor as shown here to deep for an anchor with only two branches. The increasing overburden produced a reduction in the normalized capacity as shown here. Um, and the effect of the architecture reduced as the overburden stress increased. Uh, and uh, some of the on ongoing work we have is uh, assessing the changes in the failure mechanisms, looking at this more closely, analyzing uh, the more complex architectures and also play with different uh, material stiffnesses. 
So now moving to the last topic, by inspired probes and soil penetration. The uh, goal of this, uh, or the motivation rather, is that soil penetration and excavation are uh, ubiquitous processes in, in civil engineering applications for installation of foundations, site characterization, both in land, but also in space, as well as construction of tunnels and offshore drilling. In addition, a large portion of the impact to projects uh, comes from uh, soil penetration processes, not only for the energy that's required to overcome the penetration resistance, really it comes mostly from the, the large equipment that we need to bring to the site to be able to excavate or penetrate the soil. And lastly, there's many sites that have limited access, like for example, at the toe of a dam, urban areas, forested areas, and even in space. And so we would benefit from not having to bring that heavy equipment to the sites. And so we look at nature and uh, we have um, uh, uh, obtained inspiration from this tip and anchor template. That's used by several organisms, for example, Sicilians, which are uh, amphibians that live in the ground. They essentially, they have this ability to um, undulate their spine to, to make their body wider. And so then their whole body turns into an anchor and then they can straighten the spine and, and push forward. And that's how they move to deeper locations. Razor clams do something similar where they expand their shell and then they use that to push down their foot as well as earth and marine worms through their peristalsis process. So we're interested in this and we want to apply it to uh, in situ testing tools. For this, we use a discrete element uh, model, which is a discrete approach that models each particle individually, as well as the contacts between them. The contacts are modeled with uh, a series of, of simple rules based on sliders, dampers, and springs. And as we can see here on the right, one of the main benefits is that we can track the displacements and forces of every particle in the assembly. This is just a little bit of background of our model. We have a probe that has uh, similar dimensions to a conventional CPT probe. We have a calibration chamber, a virtual calibration chamber that we can apply a constant vertical stress and radial stress as well. And we're using about 200,000 particles. And we're applying an overburden stress here of 100 kPa for all the simulations that I'm showing. And we can track different uh, variables inside of our specimen with uh, measurement spheres, including stresses and strain rates. I do want to mention that we have triaxial and CPT calibrations for this, but I don't have um, time to present them today. And so this is a description of the self-penetration process that we modeled. It starts with a, a comb penetration. Here, we just push the probe down into the ground and we track the tip resistance and friction sleeve. Then once we reach the desired depth, we expand our anchor and then we measure the radial pressure as well as the bearing pressure. And then after that, we move into the tip advancement process where we load the tip against the anchor here in a way that only the element that mobilizes the smallest force moves. So this is coded in DEM. Uh, and uh, a good analogy for this control algorithm is a Nosterberg cell uh, test that's used in the field. So these are force chains for the three different processes. In, in our CPT penetration, we see the, the um, interparticle forces increasing near the tip, as we would expect. That gives us our tip resistance. For anchor expansion now, I am uh, expanding the anchor here. What we see is the contact force is increasing, but at the same time, you can notice that the contact forces near the tip decrease. In the tip advancement, I am moving only the portion that mobilizes the smallest uh, amount. And so we see that the tip moves down and the anchor also had to move up. And we also modeled anchors with two, uh, sorry, we, 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 we modeled probes with two anchors and we can see the process here. Here, this is better because we have two bearing areas that give us a, a greater capacity. So uh, this is what the self-penetration process looks like. Here, I'm gonna be plotting uh, the penetration resistance as a function of this parameter, which we call the normalized time step. This is just normalized time uh, so that we could fit everything in one plot. Uh, 
Zero to one is the first stage comb penetration. So we push the probe at a constant rate and we mobilize our tip resistance of about five megapascal. We can track the uh, stress fields and as we would expect, the stresses are greater near the tip. We can now move to the second stage, anchor expansion. And so here, the anchor uh, pressure in blue increases. The bearing pressure also increases, but interestingly, the tip resistance drops. Now we can look at the stress maps here, but it's actually more interesting to look at stress maps of uh, changes. These are changes between the end of comb penetration and the end of anchor expansion. And so what we can see is the uh, increases around the anchor in red and the decreases near the tip in blue, particularly for the vertical stresses. Now, once we're done, then we uh, start our tip advancement process. We see that the tip starts fluctuating and then it increases and remobilizes. The anchor pressure stays constant uh, and then it drops and the bearing pressure co stays constant and then it goes up. Why that happens is related to the balance of the forces. Before this point, a uh, normalized time step of 2.5, the anchor force was greater, so it stayed constant. The penetration force was fluctuated until it increased to a value that was greater. So we can now look at here, the tip was moving because its force was smaller, but then once its force became greater then the anchor started moving. We can look at the stress change maps. And also here we see the remobilization of the tip down here in the red. We see the mobilization of the bearing force down here that corresponds to that increase in the dash line and the drop in the radial pressure that we see here in the drop. Um, we can put all of this together in this, uh, in this type of analysis. This is just the difference between the tip displacement and the anchor displacement. We call this the self-penetration distance. Um, and this is a series of simulations for different anchor tip distance H. We realized that this parameter mattered a lot for very small distances that probes were more able to self-penetrate. But when the, uh, when the anchor was very far away, then it actually failed and the anchor lifted. The reason for that are the changes in the stress where having the anchor very close to the tip produced a very sharp reduction in the tip resistance. However, after we started the tip advancement stage, that tip resistance remobilizes back to the same level. Here you can see that that reduction during the anchor expansion is greatest for small uh, h. Here is normalized by the diameter of the probe. By the time we have an h over d of eight, there's really no decrease. These are results for uh, different parameters. Uh, here we change the length of the anchor. And as we would expect, longer anchors give us greater capacities. So the self-penetration distance is greater. Also, the expansion magnitude, how much we expand the diameter of the probe, also um, correlated with greater uh, self-penetration distances as shown here in the red line, and also the friction coefficient of the anchor translated higher friction coefficient to greater self-penetration distances. And I mentioned the probes with two anchors, and so here are just a couple of snippets of the results. Um, and, and I'm comparing to single anchors. If we have just a single anchor that's short, an L equals to two diameters, the failure mechanism is, is contained here. Here I'm showing particle displacements. If it's longer, then it's bigger. If I have two anchors with a short length, similar to this one, but they're really close to each other, the failure mechanism is very similar to that of a single anchor with twice the length. But as I increase the spacing between them, by the time it reaches spacing of six, then each of the failure mechanisms is acting in an individual way, as shown here. These are self-penetration distance uh, uh, curves, showing that for the spacing, greater values give a better performance for self-penetration. And that is due to the interaction between the anchors. When the anchors are very close to each other, then the passive resistances here on the bearing side 
uh, start interacting between them. And so then the stresses cannot increase quite as much. Whereas when the anchors are far away from each other, then each one can produce increases in, stre in stress behind and leading to this large self-penetration distance. We can put all of this together in this three-dimensional space that has the expansion magnitude. It has the, the position of the anchor relative to the, to the tip here, as well as the spacing. And this defines essentially the conditions that allow us to achieve tip advancement over here to those that resulted in a failure. And that's explained by this uh, equation for that plane. So finally, takeaways from here is that the simulated tip and anchor probe was uh, able to self-penetrate medium dense uh, coarse grain soil, but we do have to assess the performance in different soil types. The tip and anchor interacted significantly between them, and we saw that decrease in tip resistance, uh, which is temporary, and that's a good thing because that means that we would be able to use uh, uh, correlations that use QC to estimate um, uh, soil engineering properties. But at the same time, it's not such a good thing because that decrease we see as shown in our stress map is temporary. The anchor pressure also was uh, shown to decrease during self-penetration. Um, as shown, the probe geometry had a very important effect on the self-penetration resistance. And this point talks about the remobilization of the tip resistance that I already already discussed. Um, and we are, have an ongoing collaboration with Contech on the design and fabrication of a prototype that we hope to test in sandy and clay, clay sites uh, in the future. So with that, I would like to move to uh, my closing thoughts. Uh, in, in a general sense, uh, there are many, many um, biological strategies that address challenges that are very analogous to those in geotechnical engineering from soil penetration and excavation to load transfer, slope stability, and so on. Um, there's an uh, there are essential steps in identifying the biological strategies. One of them is uh, getting familiarized with the biological literature and if possible, collaborating with biologists. And I think uh, whenever there's a question that's of, of interest to both engineers and biologists, that can be the best situation. There's a need to abstract the engineering problem and the biological strategy, and in particular, to assess differences in spatial and temporal scales, as well as differences in stresses and material properties. Uh, by inspired geotechnics is a growing field. There's a, a growing number of papers and research coming out. And I think the research can focus on very fundamental questions. For example, we could um, study uh, the relevant geomechanical processes in the interactions between animals or, or plants and their environment, the environment being the soil or geomaterial. However, I believe that it can also lead to the development of practical solutions. And just three examples from, from my presentation today could be new types of surfaces for foundations and soil reinforcement, new architecture for soil nails, and new tools, new tools for soil penetration and excavation. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, we had a, a workshop uh, back in 2019 that was funded by the NSF. And so this is a picture of the workshop. We had uh, about 60 attendees from different fields, ranging from uh, geotechnical engineering to biology and physics, and also people from industry, from uh, foundations, ground improvement, site, site characterization, and so on. And so we have uh, summarized the products of this um, um, uh, workshop in this paper published in Geotechnique. And so you can access them if you want, it's open access. And with that, I just want to acknowledge the contributions of uh, many individuals, uh, many students that have helped throughout the years, as well as many colleagues from different institutions. I also want to acknowledge the financial support uh, from CBBG, the Center for Geotechnical Modeling and NSF, and uh, with that, I just want to say thank you, and um, I'll be glad to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Alejandro. Uh, so this question comes from Aditya Parihar from Thapar Institute of Engineering and Technology, Patiala, Punjab, India. Uh, so his question is, 
how much loading intensity can a bio inspired soil system bear um, that, yeah, that, that's an interesting question. And, and um, I don't think there's an inherent limitation. Uh, it, I think it depends on, on the particular aspects of, uh, of whatever we're designing. For example, if we think of the snakeskin inspired, um, um, snakeskin inspired foundations, they would be made out of concrete or steel. So from that point of view, they wouldn't be any different. However, we should assess, for example, whether the texturing on the outside, whether it will be damaged uh, or not. And so that's something uh, that we hope to address uh, in field tests. I think it's a similar uh, uh, situation for the tree root inspired um, uh, soil anchor. Uh, having a complex geometry could lead to breakage of some of those elements. And so uh, that's something that needs to be assessed, but I think it's a specific to each solution. So the second question comes from Joy from the University of Sydney. Uh, so once we are going for the tree roots 3D construction, which kind of softwares you use and how do you reconstruct the tree roots in the software? Yes, um, I believe that we use the software Blender uh, for the reconstruction of the of the three D geometry, um, we used we used two two different methods for the light the, for the lighter. I believe we used Blender. Uh, I I may be wrong. I would have to to double check with the, with the, the student that did it to give you the 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 specific name. But I believe it was Blender uh, for the photogrammetry that we did. I can't remember the name of the software right now, but they were both open source. Uh, and so we, we were able to do it all with, uh, with available software. With the tree roots, the similar question from the University of Malaysia. Uh, so the tree roots in the actual sites are not as straight and it's bent and all. So once we are going for the pullout test, how accurate it resemble the actual situation on site? Yes, that, that's a great question. And, and, and I think that's probably the biggest challenge of, of that, uh, that technology. Because um, tree root systems, as, as the question uh, said it, are very complex and very complicated to the point that I think it's going to be impossible to build something like that in the field. We just can't do it. I think that the approach that we could take is to try to understand from that very complicated system of elements, what are the main attributes that provide anchorage capacity? It could be the orientation of the roots, it could be how close the roots are, but it could also be how the roots deform and lead to that progressive transfer of load. And so that's what we were trying to do with our centrifuge test. We simplified the geometry a lot with the purpose of seeing how the different elements interact if they're close to each other. And so um, anyways, I, I think that's a, that's a really good question because it's a really hard problem to do. Uh, in the end, if we designed uh, soil anchors for the field, they will very likely look very simplified compared to a natural root system. And, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's an attribute of our ability to build uh, things underground uh, in a controlled manner. Okay. Uh, one more question from my side. Like when we are thinking of the snake skin or any roots, uh, have you ever considered the like what is the chemical or maybe what is the what is the composition of the skin or is it affecting any kind of the frictional angle or the movement? Um, for, for the snake skin, I don't think there's a, a chemical interaction that's uh, of relevance, at least for the friction. Um, there's two main mechanisms there. Well, there's actually three. One is just the shape, which is what we've done. The second one is the bending because this, the scales can actually bend a little bit. And so we have done a little bit of work in that direction. Other people have done more work on that. And the third one is that the snakes can actually move muscles and so they can move their scales on purpose. Um, and so we, uh, we chose as a baseline, the, the simplest one, which is just the geometry. But for the tree roots, there are chemical 
uh, interactions at the interface uh -huh. between uh, the, the, the root okay. and the soil. And so when it comes to the friction uh, at that interface between the root and the soil, then there are chemical chemical reactions that are important. And, and, and so that's not something we have addressed um, so far, but, but they are nonetheless important. Yeah. Uh, so one last question from uh, Louis uh, University, the Kosha. Why did you use plum trees for modeling? Uh, even you can use some wet wet grass is more commonly used. Why have choose this plum trees? Well, we use the, the trees because um, they, um, I guess we, we, we pick these three trees because there, there's differences in the anchorage capacity yeah, that are known in the plant sciences uh, world uh, uh, for that. Um, and so for example, the Lovell is usually considered a, a higher performer when it comes to uprooting, but uh, we believe that the high asymmetry of the trees in, in, in our site uh, led to the low capacities. Um, but going back to your question, uh, the vetiver grasses are uh, um, studied quite a bit for slope stabilization. And so I'm not, I'm not saying that they're not a good analog for, uh, for soil nails, they could be, but at some point one has to choose, do we go with one or do we go with, with a different one? One of the challenges with the grass would be that a lot of times they, they actually evolve so that if you're pulling on them, um, they break right above the roots so that the grass keeps the roots uh, so that it, it doesn't die. And that was a process of evolution. But anyway, so, uh, having said that, there have been other groups, uh, for example, at Georgia Tech, that they looked at grasses instead of, of root tree root systems for uh, further inspiration. I think at the end of the day, it's it's a matter of uh, uh, preference and 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 what uh, each research group believes is is more uh, yeah. directly applicable. But but a lot of this by inspired process is very iterative, right? We pick one yes. analog, but then we could pick another one or another one, and so that's kind of uh, the beauty of it. That uh, there's no guarantee that whatever we choose is going to be the, the best solution. Yeah, and that's the beauty of nature, I think, uh, the diversity. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alejandro.